Good morning, everybody. We're just going to wait a few more minutes as people get logged in. But while we do that, I just want to remind uh, everyone that as you're joining, you are in the listen only mode. You are automatically muted when you come into the GoToWebinar. Um, if you need to change the functionality of your audio uh, through the presentation, maybe you're having some um, internet issues, you can toggle back and forth between uh, your phone or your computer audio at any time. So feel free to do that. Um, we'll take questions. Uh, you can type questions uh, while our three speakers are talking. If something comes to mind, we'll, we'll save most of those though for the end. Uh, we'll do a question and answer session at the end. Just type those into the question box um, on the uh, GoToWebinar and we'll shift through those questions as, as we uh, move through the presentation this morning. And if for any reason we're not able to address all the questions uh, this morning, feel free to email me uh, any questions you have afterwards or if you would like additional information uh, and we'll go ahead and get that to you. All right, Gayla, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you everyone out there for joining us here in Missouri. Um, as Keith was talking to all of our panelists this morning, we've had very encouraging numbers coming in and, and viewing our webinar live, but then also following up because it is being recorded. Um, but he was um, speaking this morning about how great our panelists are this morning, that this panelist has risen to the top and have the most um, people registered for this webinar. So good morning. Great to have all of you guys from Missouri and beyond. Um, who are we with this morning? So we are with Chillicothe and Chillicothe, Missouri, we believe is one of our greatest award-winning Main Street communities. And we're excited to, excited to present to you all to them um, and them to you this morning because they are just an amazing group that's really going to share some very valuable information. Um, and as Keith said, as we're going through this presentation, if you guys have any questions, be sure to be typing those in because these are the folks that can be answering those questions um, as we're moving forward. So we have Ed Douglas with us and he's the presiding commissioner um, in Chillicothe. Good morning, Ed. Good morning. We have Teresa Kelly and Teresa is actually the mayor. Good morning, Teresa. Good morning. Yay. And then we have Darren Chapel. Darren um, is the city administrator in Chillicothe. So good morning, Darren. Good morning, Gayla. All right. And uh, as some of you guys are watching live, you're not just listening to us. You can see that Darren just talked to me, but it says Ben White. Um, Ben White is actually on our team and he went to the rescue this morning to the city of Chillicothe and helped out and took his computer. So that is why Darren is labeled as Ben White this morning. Um, but um, Ben yeah. lives right there in Chillicothe, so it works. <laughs> we had our own on-site IT person ready to go. There That's go. right. We called him our superhero this morning. <laughs> um, but what is really great about this morning's webinar is that we have three different entities that work very well together. And I'm hoping that through this presentation that there's other cities, other county commissioners, um, other mayors out there, Main Street organizations, of course, knowing that this can be done and that we can work together through this crisis and come together and support our small businesses and our Main Street program um, in our community. So we're really glad to have you all with us. I want to talk about just a little bit about mornings on Maine next Wednesday before we get um, started because we're really excited about that one as well. Um, it's Randy Wilson from Community Design Solutions. Many of you all, we've had Randy come in to the Main Street communities and do work. He is our design specialist. Um, he actually yesterday also did a webinar. Um, Keith, what are they calling that again? So I was going to do a quick commercial too. You know, we're at uh, if the COVID-19 pandemic hadn't happened, we would all be at the National Main Street Conference this week. Um, it yeah. would be in Dallas this week, and so we're all missing that. So a group of consultants uh, put together. Uh, it's on Facebook. It's called the Downtown Happy Hour, but they've put together a three-day conference all online. And so yesterday was the first day, and mm -hmm. Randy presented on how to, to, to be thinking about design as a Main Street community 
in this new COVID-19 environment and uh, things to be thinking about and really did an excellent job of visually demonstrating all the things that, that can be done now uh, or that are uh, maybe should be done now related to outdoor seating, activating spaces you wouldn't normally think about activating to allow for people to, to social distance. So we've asked uh, Randy to come and, and uh, be our presenter next Wednesday. And I think you're gonna, you're gonna find a lot of very cool and neat ideas uh, for your downtown uh, next week from Randy. Yeah, so we're really excited to have him. He's always great to come into our communities and he wows them. We always have Randy go, you know, when we're doing presenting the refresh four points, um, we're always like, okay, Randy has to go to the end because nobody would listen to the rest of us because he always has the pretty show. So <laughs> be sure to tune in um, with us next Wednesday morning as well. So we're just gonna get started. So we have a lot to cover and we have our three great pan panelists. Um, so Ed, we're gonna start with you and I'm just gonna start you off and then Keith is gonna take you guys through some series of questions. Um, but Ed, if you would just kind of kick us off here and talk about how things are working within the um, County Commission Office with COVID-19, just, just give us a background where you guys are right now. Sure, give you, give you a little background. Um, this is kind of uncharted territory for all of us. And uh, so s several weeks ago, I got a call from the uh, state treasurer's office saying that if we got some paperwork in pretty quickly, we'd get the first go round of, of, of money that comes through the CARES Act through the state to us. And so uh, I signed an agreement as chief executive of the county uh, under, penal of per under penalty of perjury that, uh, you know, we'd only use the money for certain things and not use the money for other things like backfilling budgets and things like that. And uh, so I signed that. Uh, we got the money in, oh, maybe 10 days ago or something. And uh, uh, we're, at least in County, for those of you that are on, is uh, a county of a little over 15,000. Uh, Chillicothe is the, is the major town. It's nearly 10,000. So uh, it's, it's about two thirds of the county. One of the things I would mention is that, uh, of course, this money came into the county for, for use of the entire county. And uh, we have an extremely good relationship with the city of Chillicothe. We work very well together. And uh, I've, I've read in the last week or so some, some horror stories of uh, counties and cities that don't get along so well as, as it relates to other things, but also to this CARES Act money. But, but that's not the case here. And one of the first things that, uh, since again, we are on uncharted territory, and we received actually a, a million seven hundred and eighty six thousand, uh, which is uh, of course based on uh, you know population. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that uh, I thought we should do is even though the money came into the county, is I wanted a group that included the city. And so we formed a uh, an oversight group, which is the the three county commissioners, uh, our county clerk, and then uh, our mayor, Teresa, who's here and us. Uh, City Administrator Darren Chapel, who's here, and then the uh, City Clerk. Uh, also, we add the uh, head of the uh, Health Department. So that's our oversight group that we that we established. Now, one of the next things we did was try to really study the the guidelines. And uh, I actually called the State Treasurer's Office, said at one point, and said, "Can you give me some extra guidance on this?" And they said, "Hey, what you see is what we know too." So we wow. started just. We started to just look at the uh, the guidelines and try to figure out where the major areas are. Uh, obviously, uh, trying to do what we can. And, and you know, as as the document talks about, this is supposed to be things that are unbudgeted expenses that are used to offset the COVID-19 um, health health disaster. So, what can you do to uh, to use that money? And so. Some of the uh, and we we felt that that our design was to use the money. If we if we don't use it by the end of the year, we have to uh, give it back. And so we we went through there. And obviously, one of the first things which will involve our health director is you know what can we do in in terms of testing and and supplies and protective equipment. And so uh, in fact, we approved yesterday as an oversight committee uh, some dollars that the health center needs. Uh, to get to get started in that area. Uh, the, the second thing that we thought was really pressing was to provide some relief to our small businesses. And so uh, we and we want it, we want to do that as quickly as we can. And so we've been having regular meetings 
and yesterday we finished up a uh, an application for businesses and we're putting it on various websites the chamber the main street uh the county commission and uh and the city's facebook page and uh, we're trying to get applications into us in the next couple of weeks and what we did we formed a, a subcommittee uh that's that's helping the oversight committee and that subcommittee can consists of uh, all five of the banks in our town uh or in the county um also our our main street our chamber of commerce and our uh, chillicothe industrial development corporation we thought together those people would know uh who needs money and uh and so We'd, we'd like to get, we, we, we're going to go over these applications very early in June to try to get money out to people. And we're dedicating, who knows how much it'll be, but probably uh, probably uh, close to a third of the money uh, we want to make available to businesses. And, uh, you know, I don't know what the, it'll depend how many applicants we get, but it'll be, you know, it could be 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 or more, maybe 10,000 for these businesses that, have been uh, closed. And and one of the things that was interesting when we looked at the guidelines, it talked about um, required closures, but in, in a lot of the questions and answers that we reviewed, a required closure doesn't mean you had to have a stay at home order. We did not have a stay at home order. And, uh, but a lot of businesses, whether they were a restaurant or a, a hair salon, uh, did have to close because of the close contact. And then we had other retailers that just people wouldn't wouldn't show up at. And I, I talked to a retailer that uh, uh, on our main street who who said they you know they weren't forced to close, but basically all their suppliers in New York and Chicago were closed for three weeks and their servicer in another county was closed. So they were effectively closed. Mm -hmm. So we know that we have a lot of uh, small businesses, businesses on Main Street and, and others. That, so that's one of our first priorities is trying to get money out to these businesses to help them. The other things that we did as, as an oversight group, the city and the county and our health and our health director, is we, we had several other meetings in areas that we thought the guidelines tended to uh, lend themselves to. So we had another group where we had, it was distance learning was one of the areas. And so we had uh, three school superintendents in, along with uh, uh, um, our uh, telephone company, a local telephone company, to talk about what we could do relative to distance learning. And then we had a group, uh, there's another area that talks about providing food to the vulnerable, which could be the elderly and, and the poor. And so we had a number of groups in to tell them about this and get their ideas and uh, you know, encourage them to write proposals to us. You know, we had the Ministerial Alliance and the Senior Group and Salvation Army and the YMCA and uh, and the House of Prayer and, and a number of different groups. So that was another group. And then finally, we had a, we had uh, the nursing homes all come in. We wanted to hear what they were doing and wanted to see if we could help in the sanitizing of nursing homes because, as you read nationally, that's been where probably half the deaths have occurred. And so we wanted to be sure that that if they needed money that qualified, that um, that it was available. So as I said, we're all on that kind of uncharted territory, but our first pr two priorities are been, are been uh, regarding the health center and and secondly, to uh, uh, to get money out to businesses. And so that's, that's kind of been our strategy. And uh, uh, we're just, you know, we got a good group and we're, we're, uh, uh, we're working well together and uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Ed, I want to ask a couple of questions of you and then we'll get into kind of uh, granular down into more of the city level. So what are the, there? it's my understanding there are two main themes of uses for this money. Can you explain what those two themes are? Well, from our standpoint, uh, again, helping small business, and and the healthcare aspect of trying to prevent the disease from spreading and protecting the population those have been our our two and then we've looked down further and looked at some other areas again feeding feeding the needy and the vulnerable and uh, nursing homes and uh, distance learning have been the main ones but we're we're trying to get there there are several pages of, of potential 
you know, qualifying and, and we tried to get that out to the community to say, listen, you may have an area that we haven't thought about. Please review this and, and get us back a proposal. Okay. Um, Teresa, yesterday when we chatted, you talked about um, the, the biggest thing that has helped you guys through this is the relationships that uh, between the city and the county. Do you want to talk about that for just a minute? This just didn't happen overnight. It did not hope happen overnight. And I think we had an advantage because our oversight committee had been meeting since the beginning of the pandemic uh, on teleconference phone calls almost daily. And so when Ed presented this with us that we were gonna receive this much money, we decided we needed to reach out and find out who, who needed the money and the, the easiest way to find out. So we did contact um, the chamber, uh, the Visitors Bureau, Amy at the Visitors Bureau, uh, Main Street, and they do know our downtown uh, small business owners. They know all the business owners, and that has been a big help. Mm -hmm. Them coupled with our banks, we were able to put together um, an application that is going out today, I believe, on the web and on Facebook, and I, I don't want to forget our city and county clerk have been a huge help, and um, we've just kind of worked with them and um, through the whole thing those organizations have helped us and now we're reaching out to the banks and everyone else and I think we'll continue to have a good relationship and we're working together. Great. Darren tell me about you know, from the city's perspective um, the utilization of these funds as, as Ed said and as the, the uh, treasurer noted in the guidelines they can't be used for normal city budget items, and they can't be used to fill in revenue shortfalls. So how is the city utilizing uh, the funds that are coming through the CARES Act through the county? Yeah, uh, from a municipal perspective, it, it is a little it is a little frustrating, uh, the, some of the limitations on the governmental entities. Um, I, I understand why they don't want cities that have managed themselves poorly to try to get right off of the uh, CARES Act, I certainly understand that. But the uh, simple fact of the matter, of course, is for all of us in municipal government, county government, the work of the of, of the county and the city has to go on. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, when businesses are closed, uh, it makes it extraordinarily difficult to collect those revenue streams right. that 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 fund those opportunities. Um, and, and I think it's important that. Uh, to say again, you know, we didn't we didn't close down our community. Mm -hmm. uh, we did, you know, we follow the governor's orders, obviously, but we worked really hard to try to have as much uh, activity for our local businesses as we possibly could, uh, because of you know uh, everybody effectively losing their minds there for the first few weeks. Uh, uh, we tried really hard to. Uh, to not go into that direction, um, but given given what it is, uh, we are looking for ways in which to, uh, uh, according to the guidelines, use the funds of the CARES Act at the municipal level. Um, in Chillicothe, uh, we we actually have a, uh, a women's uh, correctional facility here in Chillicothe, and one of the things that we rely on heavily, quite frankly, is the um, uh, offenders work release program and they work in our parks they work in our street departments and uh, it, it's it's beneficial to them they you know the prisoners are are, are paid uh, they get to be outside which is a big deal and uh, it's extraordinarily beneficial to the uh, taxpayers because we're able to get a lot of work done for a lot less uh, money than you would otherwise be able to do However, since the prison is uh, laid in for right now for this uh, coronavirus, we don't have access to that labor. And so we're having to hire individuals to uh, overcome that. And so because that was not a budgeted expense and it's directly the result of the coronavirus, that would indeed be covered by the CARES Act funding. Uh, that's just one example of what we're looking at, trying to think outside the box to use a well-worn phrase, but uh, you know we're 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 looking for ways that we can uh, enhance our community effort uh, along with the county and the public health office and 
Main Street and all of the other partners that we have and uh, have that funding come from the CARES Act so that the taxpayers are not further burdened by those activities. Sure, sure. And so I don't know if, if uh, Ed or Darren, if you want to answer the question, um, you mentioned, and, and I'm sure this is where a lot of folks are, are very interested to hear, is how are you working with your Main Street Chamber Tourism to provide those um, grants to the local businesses? How are you structuring those? What are the parameters of that? Um, uh, give us a little more information on how that's working in Chillicothe. Well, I'll, I'll try to tackle that a little. We, we, uh, the chamber and uh, Main Street and everyone was in, in CIDs, our Industrial Development Corporation, the banks, our oversight committee. We were all involved in putting uh, this this uh, application together. We wanted to make it as simple as possible so that we didn't discourage people from applying, but also try to get the information that we needed. And so um, we asked very basic questions of name, address, and phone number, and uh, number of employees we did ask were they part or did they participate in the ppp program uh you know which is used for payroll that mm -hmm. isn't necessarily an excluder from them getting additional money uh because we think there are there are needs in addition to the ppp program but we thought we wanted to know that mm -hmm. we uh we asked for a uh, a narrative uh just explaining and then they also will need to provide us receipts and uh, ultimately before we disperse the money, our, our county attorney has worked out kind of a, an agreement where they'll sign and basically say that what they've presented to us is, uh, is truthful. And uh, so it's, it's a basic application. They also, when, when they present us receipts, which we'll have to have, one, one of the things I'll mention is that our oversight committee decided to uh, uh, hire an accounting firm uh, won't be extremely costly. It's just on an hourly basis to make sure that we do everything according to Hoyle. Uh, and so uh, they'll be, uh, you know, issuing the checks. Uh, they'll be collecting our documentation, both the applications from businesses and other entities, as well as then receipts. And they'll keep it all in one file. And the thought on that is that we, if we ultimately uh, do ever get audited, having an accounting firm, having all this a documentation together would be would be helpful for us. So mm -hmm. that's that's one of the things that uh, we've done. But the, the application is very simple, I think, and uh, and uh, gives them an opportunity and not just expense replacement, but uh, uh, potential uh, income loss is is a is a source too. What if a uh, is this part of your process? Um, if uh, let's say it's a restaurant, and I don't know, do you have any restrictions on the number of um, occupants in a restaurant in in Livingston County currently Darren go ahead yeah uh, we're restaurants are all of our restaurants are small enough that they fall under the governor's guidelines of having a 25 percent of occupancy maximum okay so um, are you um, would your grant program for those small businesses allow them to purchase outdoor seating so that they can increase their capacity or maybe add a um, a, a back patio of some sort, uh, it, would that qualify for that program? Potentially, I tell you what we've talked about is our answers with these funds are yes and maybe. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're really not saying no at, at any point right now because this is so uncharted territory that we mm -hmm. wanna think about some of those things. And so I think what you said, yes, the possibility. Let me give you another example on restaurants. We know of a restaurant that had to throw away their inventory. Yes, they got PPP money, but they could use some money to to restock themselves. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I I wanted to, if I could, just for a second, jump on uh, the question when you said how how are we working with Main Street and and um, the other partners in this? Um, Gala said at the beginning that you know Chillicothe has been recognized nationally several times in the Main Street uh, world, and we're very very proud of our community and our main street in our downtown area um, our main street and our director is pam jarding who also happens to be on my city council by the way uh, uh, but pam does a fantastic job and uh, working with the chamber visitors bureau the city the county all of the downtown partners and stakeholders 
but she and uh, the Chamber and Visitors Bureau, especially those three organizations from day one on the uh, coronavirus issue have been working with our downtown businesses, trying to direct them toward grant opportunities, trying to direct them toward uh, ways in which they could overcome, not, not, not violate the governor's orders, but let's work within the rules and get the maximum output. So when this CARES Act money came into uh, fruition, those partners that we have, Main Street being one of the chief of those, um, they have just simply made it to where we're able to communicate with our business community much more effectively. Not everybody reads the newspaper, not everybody listens to the radio, not everybody uses Facebook, although you would never know it, right? Uh, <laughs> but not everybody does. So by having those those connections and those partnerships that we have and uh, just can't sing Main Street's praises highly enough and how, how good of a job they've done and, and Pam in particular. Great. Well, you know, uh, from the National Main Street organization on down to the local Main Street, we've all been trying to communicate and uh, a lot of the job that Main Street has been doing over the last six to eight weeks has been the PR manager, the communication manager. You know, how do we keep all the entities informed about A, what's happening, but B, what are some of those programs and, and things out there? So, Ed, um, you mentioned that PPP doesn't necessarily disqualify them from receiving uh, a possible business grant from your community. Would the same thing be for EIDL, the other program that uh, SBA offered? As I said, we haven't excluded anything. We didn't ask that specific question on the application. But, you know, from our standpoint, and, and remember, Chillicothe's 10,000, the county's 15,000. And, and, and with the players we've got, all the banks, Main Street, Industrial Development Corporation, Chamber of Commerce, between the application, our oversight committee, and that subgroup, we feel like we're going to know these people pretty well and know whether they have a need. I mean, you know, Main Street goes out and communicates with these, with their businesses very regularly, and so is the Chamber. And so we're going to know, we're going to know these people many times over. And and, and I told our group too, I said, we got to remember with this, anytime you try to do something to, to benefit your, your, your community, uh, you're going to make mistakes. And so are there going to be people that get money that, that don't deserve it as much as other people? Probably. Are there going to be people that don't get money or don't get enough that should get more? Sure. Probably. All we can do is the best we can do and, and, and on balance try to help people, but it's, it's not going to be perfect. There's just no way. And we just have to, with this group we have, we think we've got a chance with the, all those minds together to, to do the best we can. Yep. Our, our speak, our, hold on, uh, Darren, just one real quick thing I want to reiterate that is that our speaker last week said the same thing, is that we, not, nobody's been through something like this before. And so we have to try things. And some of those things aren't going to work out as well, um, but we have to be trying things. And so, um, yeah, go ahead, Darren. Well, I, I was just gonna, I was just gonna clarify too. It, it's not that e EIDL or PPP are disqualifying characteristics, but we are trying to make sure that those items that were covered under those grants are not reapplied for under sure. the CARES. Act. We don't want to double dip. Right. Uh, right. Not yep. not only because of the unfairness of that you know, from the outset, but right. every dollar that's given out to one person can't be given out to somebody else. Yep. How do we spread those dollars to make the most impact? Exactly. Yep. yep. Um, Teresa, you talked about those relationships and those various entities that you guys met with. So CARES Act can go for um, medical, um, things related to COVID-19 emergency type situations. So what are some of those relationships that you guys talked with or met with different groups to, to determine if they had a need? Actually, uh, our health center was our number one priority and she is on our uh, oversight committee. So we pretty much told her what she needs and it's allowable that she can go ahead and get it. Um, as Ed said, we have reached out to all the nursing homes, the adult daycare and whatever that, and asked for their needs and um, told them to give us a description of what they needed and apply for anything they would need. Um, I have to say teamwork has been of the utmost importance and we have the whole community involved 
and we're reaching out to everybody to see what the needs are and I, I think we're going to um, hear from everybody that needs them. Okay. Um, I have a question about the application. Well, actually, did, did, did the city of Chillicothe have to fill out an application to the county to receive the funding, or did that just come because of that relationship and it really being your largest uh, community okay. within the county? Well, that, that's an interesting question, Keith. Our attorney for the county said that uh, for every applicant, we are going to need this agreement that he's prepared that, again, makes them say that they're they're signing an agreement. And uh, so that could be a business, it could be a not-for-profit. And uh, But in addition to that, every, uh, every uh, government entity needs to sign one. Now, it's kind of interesting, the city, because of their structure, just needs to sign one, what we call an intergovernmental agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, for the county, it's a little different because uh, even though, you know, you might think, well, they just, you know, but every one of our elected officials is is elected separately. And so in some respects, they're kind of a separate entity. And so uh, we're going to have to have a separate uh, intergovernmental agreement from each of our elected officials that uh, request some. And, and uh, there's some things we're going to be doing. We've talked about uh, things like... Um, in each of the offices having a protective uh, plexiglass mm -hmm. that that actually also might help in the in terms of security down the road too uh right. but, but that would certainly prevent spreading of diseases and so and uh darren and, and Teresa the other day talked at our meeting talked about things that they might do to to uh fix up the bathrooms in the parks and things like that to make them a lot less uh you know uh contagious and uh there's just all just all sorts of things we think we can do. One thing I, I want to mention too that I don't want to complicate things, but uh, I think I think it's important to be aware of this that you know there might be some additional money that comes to states and cities uh, to help with their budget shortfalls, mm -hmm. and who knows what that'll be. You know, you read about things being 25 to 50 percent in some places. I don't think it'll be that much here, but there are, you also hear talk from from uh, as, as you read the papers that there's a possibility at some point that th they could come back and say, okay, if you haven't used some of that money, you could use it to backfill your budget shortfalls relative to sales tax. Uh, that's something we're we're conscious of. Uh, we're trying to get the money out and use it. But mm -hmm. it, it kind of is in the back of our mind, too. Um, you know, you just kind of have to see how that plays out. Right. Um, uh, two questions, Ed. Um, I'll start with the, the first one being, does the guidelines for these funds that are flowing to the county, does it stipulate that the money then has to flow into the municipalities also? Um, I, I, there's a question, and I think we have folks that are maybe concerned that the county's just going to hoard that money um, and not necessarily share it. So, do you do you understand the guidelines of, as how they are well, written? My understanding is that they're for the entire county. In our case, as I said, our our the city of Chillicothe is is nearly two thirds of the county. So, it, there wasn't any question in our mind we needed to involve the city and all that. I, I suppose theoretically, the county could be very protective and say look we're going to make all the decisions and decided i didn't think that was appropriate or fair but i i from reading the stuff since it went to the county if if you if you see what some other counties and cities are doing that don't get along uh, i think that's a potential problem yeah i live in clay county which is a part of the kansas city metro area and you know they just took the population they have about seven communities in the county and they just took the dollars and divided it up based upon population and they're pushing that money out to each of the municipalities the county held on to a little portion um, so they could deal with their health emergency type things and the things they needed to do that follow those guidelines but pushed the that, rest out to the communities and, with and that, is, that is a possibility that that we could have done that too but my position i think our commission's position on that was this is a big enough responsibility and the money came into us that although we wanted the, the maximize cooperation and working together that we didn't want to remove ourselves 
from mm -hmm. some of the decisions that were going to be made. And that's why we formed this group to do it together rather than separate ourselves. Sure. sure. And I'll say Clay County's done the same thing you guys did. They had weekly calls um, as the crisis was unfolding and kept those lines of communication open and uh, kind of developed that plan uh, together. together. Um, so, you know, Ed, you talked about getting that money pushed out. Darren, you know, we hear that the, you know, nationwide, possibly one in five small businesses could close because of this. So in thinking about your, your application and your process, um, you know, you outlined some of the things that uh, these funds could be used for. Is there, is there anything else that, uh, you know, as, you're think, as you were thinking about putting this together um, that uh, came to mind uh, when you were looking at uh, this grant program? Well, you know, we can't, as we've said multiple times, this money can't be used to uh, backfill lost tax revenues, okay? But if we support our local businesses and we help them overcome this gap in their, their earning capacity, that just immediately props up the local economy, which by definition kickstarts the local revenue streams anyway. Right. So uh, the, the, the goal of the group is to make sure a few things are, are true right off the bat. First of all, the public health office has what they need for testing and for everything else. Um, that's going to be less than $100,000 though mm -hmm. for, our, for our size county. Right. Uh, so, so, okay, now, now, now we've got 1.66 million. Now, now, now what? Uh, right. There are going to be some expenditures at the county level. There are going to be some expenditures at the city level, but because of the restrictions on government, it's not really as much as you might think. Right. And so a, a big portion of, of this is going to be for those other organizations. And, and uh, you know, I'm just one person in the group, uh, but I, I think that most of us feel the same way. We want to get as much of this into the hands of our business owners mm -hmm. as we can as quickly as possible, not not just to support our business, but because our, our local economy right. needs that in infusion. Right. Yep. Perfect. And I, I'll just announce, too, that we put together a little fact sheet um, and sent it out, I believe it was two Fridays ago now, um, that outlined this program and how communities could start utilizing those dollars because we're hearing the same thing, Darren, is that, okay, we have some additional expenses, but we can't spend all of this money that's coming to us in, in that medical emergency field. So the other piece of that, uh, uh, the, those funds is the economic development piece of it, the business support piece of it. And so, how do we, what are the programs and things that we can put together to help support our business community? And so we pushed out a, a fact sheet and, and I'll just say right now, we'll push it out to everybody um, on this webinar today too, because there's some ideas on there and we've talked about some of those already, you know, uh, repurchasing inventory, um, adding outdoor seating options for, for restaurants and some of those things. The other thing I wanted to mention is, have you guys had conversations with your main street and your chamber, those entities that do events outside in your community about supplying helping them fund or, or purchase hand sanitation stations and some extra equipment that are now going to be needed for those big events that you have uh, outside as you're gathering people together yeah that actually came up at our meeting yesterday the main street uh, director uh, pam jarding brought up the possibility of a, a, a lot of additional hand sanitizers and even seating possibility that would allow you know social distancing and things like that so there's going to have to be a lot of creative thinking because i think our group's thought is that there are ideas that as we think through this we're going to think wait a minute this is something we could do that does qualify that would would benefit the county and the city and uh so we sure don't want to overlook it and and i really think we're going to come up with a, a, a more and more ideas as we have a little time to think about it. But but you're right. Main Street came up with that uh, yesterday. Yeah. yeah. And, and go ahead, Darren. Uh, I'm sorry, Keith. You know, and and you have to look at it not just how do we spend the money, but how can we spend the money in such a way as to be smart so that it has a long-term lasting effect. Has so an for just, just a very very brief example. So we're looking at the possibility of having hand sanitizer stations in our 
parts. Mm -hmm. But coronavirus is not going to be around forever. So we're looking at ones that could then maybe be used as sunscreen uh, uh, distribution, you know, or yeah. mosquito repellent or something so that, yeah. you know, you're not just, we don't want to just spend the money in order to say we spent the money. Right. We're, we're trying to be smart about it in such a way that it has a long-term impact for good for everybody involved. Yep. And, uh, you know, we mentioned at the beginning of this webinar uh, about Randy Wilson, who presented yesterday at an unconference online, um, and he, we're going to have him back next week on our webinar. But he's talking about kind of the same thing, Darren, is, okay, we have some temporary things that we've started doing, but some of these probably are going to turn into permanent. And here's an example. Let's give a shout out to Lee Summit. Um, you know, when, when, when their stay-at-home order went into effect, the restaurants are doing curbside pickup, and um, they needed some signage for that curbside pickup to hold those spaces right in front of those restaurants. Well, it was temporary, but the city is now looking at I think that curbside pickup is probably going to be here to stay. It's a convenience now that people are used to. It's another revenue stream for a restaurant. So let's look at some permanent curbside pickup signage or maybe cleaning up alleys that now you can have pickup in an alley for a restaurant out the back door. And so looking at some of those things that maybe can become permanent that are good ideas that have come out of this, uh, this pandemic situation. Yeah, absolutely. Look at look at how many meetings we've all been on uh, <laughs> via teleconference or webinar. Uh, and um, I, I think in large, large numbers, a lot of our businesses are realizing how much uh, work can be accomplished with their employees at home. And uh, just the fundamental way in which uh, business happens and people interact has changed by this. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that we're all anxious for life to go back to a new uh, normal, but some some of the things that we've taken for granted forever uh, simply have been shown to be maybe not as necessary as we thought. Maybe there is a better way to do things, and right. uh, yep. you know. So we just we just need to be when when this money is being allocated, we're trying to say uh, let's let's get the biggest bang for our buck. Let's make sure the people who need it are taken care of, but let's do it in such a way that it has a, 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 the most positive impact on the community writ large. Great. Keith, I'll give you, uh, we talked about this yesterday, I haven't finalized it, but uh, in, the, in the area of law enforcement, uh, we, we uh, transport uh, prisoners to a, a regional jail, the Davies DeKalb Jail, and uh, uh, our, our sheriff has talked about he may need a, a vehicle to separate prisoners that we take from there down to the, you know, to, to, to protect them and to protect our officers. and also, he's talked about retrofitting our existing police cars uh, so that they have a, a, gla a plexiglass screen that, that uh, protects the officers, uh, both from a, a virus contagious and, uh, and a safety thing. And, and, uh, and, and then he, he's also talking about ordering supplies of masks and sanitizing things that he can actually share with some of these other units like local uh, fire districts and things that might not want to apply on their own because they might have a hundred or two hundred dollar need or something or right. but you know we could we could share some of those things with them so again i think there'll be creative ways to uh that, that still fit the guidelines to use uh, some of these funds yeah great and i have a question about uh is the uh, grant fund that you guys put together is there a restriction on the size of the company that can apply? Is it just for small businesses? Or, and what's the definition of that? Or is it available to any business within the county, no matter the size? We, we haven't excluded based on size, but I think that's where our, our committee comes in because we have, I think, I think intuitively and in our minds, we're thinking that first off is the small business and the retailer. And, and uh, so, um, and, and, a lot of the uh, bigger businesses uh, also were not forced to close too. If you were a, a Walmart or a Lowe's or, uh, or, or you know, an industry producing things that, you know, that, that was considered essential and uh, you, you weren't forced to close. So certainly those would be down the list of waiting, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And as I said, we haven't excluded anything. Our answers are, or yes and maybe, but certainly the small business and small retailer that 
that was essentially uh, uh, closed. Um, and 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 we've kind of said too. I know at one point that there was uh, some some definitions of essential and not essential. And I, I think from our standpoint, if you've got a business, uh, you know, and that's your livelihood and stuff, that's pretty essential. So we 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 like to think that they're all essential. Right. Right. Um, Ed, do you know if the funds could be used to cover the shortfall for maybe an organization that couldn't hold events because of the coronavirus, say a Main Street program or a Chamber of Commerce? Um, I don't know for sure. We, again, that's where, you know, with what we're going to do, and in fact, we're hoping that these people that apply will point to those four or five pages of guidelines as to how that, what their request meets those guidelines because at the end of the day that's what we're going to have to refer to to protect ourselves from you know clawback of, of not abusing the money improperly so um i don't know and uh possibly but i'm just not sure okay hey, keith <clears throat> yes sir I, I you know we we've talked about such issues and, and there are different restrictions for government as opposed to private entities Sure. So while it's absolutely certain that the county and the city, we can't fill in for lost revenue, um, that may not be the case for local businesses and, and 501c3s and c4s right. and c6s. Okay. We don't have a lot of guidance from the state right now. But mm -hmm. here's the thing. Worst case scenario is they'll say no. So put the app in. You right. Know? You know, right. I, I I think that's the thing that we need to be telling our businesses and our organizations, you know, nothing bad can happen from putting in the application. Right. And and I have a feeling based upon what we hear from other communities and other states that have offered programs like this, you're going to be inundated with applications. Um, that's what we keep hearing because the impact has been so large. Um, you know, even though you guys didn't have a stay at home order for the county or for the city, people still didn't travel because of the governor's order. And, you know, it it it, it uh, cut into uh, business operations, definitely. Um, and so there's been impact uh, spread across far and wide. We, we expect to be busy in the coming days. We've, okay. we've been hearing that. We do a director's call every week and a lot of the directors are talking about um, how the rebound is happening much quicker than a lot of folks anticipated. I want to remind folks real quick, uh, we have about uh, 12 minutes left um, for any additional questions. Uh, uh, feel free to keep continuing sending those questions in. I'll continue to uh, to moderate those. Um, so what is your review process for your grant applications? Do you have a scoring system? Is it is that committee? Um, kind of tell us how that's going to work. Well, we, when we when the applications come in, we've set a deadline. As I said, we've just been posted. So we've set a deadline of uh, June 5th, and then we've got a meeting scheduled of June 9th. It'll probably be an all-day meeting. And the application will basically have the required information. It's it's one sheet, and they could provide a narrative along, to, on, along with that if they choose to. But then we're just going to use the group to, uh, uh, you know, their knowledge of those businesses to help us make decisions and frankly too since you know we don't we don't know how many applications we're going to get mm -hmm. part of part of the difficulty we hated to give an amount in fact we haven't given an amount that we would use because we don't know whether we're going to get 50 applications 100 500 or a thousand and so that obviously has a an effect on how much money we can spread around so uh but we do know we do know just as darren and, and Teresa said that you know it's so important to get the businesses going that we're going to make a sizable amount available to them and and um uh so it'll be a, it'll be a judgment call i think just based on the knowledge of that group and there's a lot of knowledge in that group yeah that's a good group of folks Teresa, did you have something to add i did back on what ed was saying about we would either say yes or maybe uh, we are not saying no at this point, but something came to my mind was one of the nursing homes uh, was in one of our meetings and, um, you know, they, they're they on lockdown and they have not been able to admit, have any new admittances. And she said they had six empty beds. Well, they wondered if that lack of revenue might 
qualify. And that's something we're looking into. We just have, we really don't know. There's a lot, gonna be a lot of questions come up and we're gonna have to make a judgment call and see that we can get the money out the best we can. Sure, sure. I've had a couple of folks ask, would you guys be willing to share your application that you're using? Can we share it with the group? Sure. I, I don't see why not. Okay, yeah. great, great. Rip off and duplicate. That's right. That's right. Uh, and we even have some examples in the office. We have been searching far and wide for uh, programs and different things. And so we do have some examples too, but I think folks have been intrigued by your process. And so, Ed, I, I have a question that's related to kind of the guidelines, but this is, I think this question is related to how you guys have set it up because each county can set it up and use whatever process they come up with. Is that correct? I think so, yeah. Okay. So you guys are allowing both nonprofits and for-profit businesses apply for your grant program. That's just how you've set it up there in Livingston County. Right. But there aren't yeah. any restrictions from the state related to that. Not that I know of. And again, we, just as Darren said, we there's no downside. And so we, anybody that thinks they might qualify and can look at the guidelines, we encourage them to s submit us a proposal. And uh, again, we, you know, our goal is to, use all these funds in a in a highest priority way as we can for the long-term benefit of the county and the city uh but we if 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 we got to the end of the year and we hadn't used all the funds uh you know we we might feel like we weren't successful so uh sure. again it, it we want it to it has to be a necessary expense that's one of the guidelines and it has to be as a result of the COVID 19 but we think those there's going to be enough things out there that if we're creative enough, um, we can make it work. Right. And, I, and that's what we've been hearing, too, is that so many things were affected by COVID-19. That does open it up a little bit more um, for those types of expenses, like Darren mentioned, because the prison um, wouldn't allow the workers to come to the city. That was an impact of, of COVID-19. And so... So I think that, yeah, there's that interpretation there. And as you asked the treasurer, give me some more, more guidelines. And the answer was, here they are. You already have them. Um, it's, I would say this too. They have, uh, they've, they've, since then, they've added some question and answer on the, so it is important to go on the, uh, on the governor's or the treasurer's website. And they added some frequently answered questions, asked questions. And so it could be that they'll be adding more over time. And so I would encourage people to keep referring to those. Sure. Um, Ed, I'm, I, I'm thinking this is just a question for you. I, I don't want to monopolize all your time, though. Um, but it's what is the process for the county with the state? You mentioned submission of receipts and things. Kind of what is that process? What do you guys have to go through as you're spending this money? Well, we're going to put we're going to have minutes in our county commission. I mean, as our oversight committee approves it, we'll take minutes and that'll be part of our county commission minutes. Again, we'll we'll submit any any request to the, the accountants who, and we had a meeting with them um, and talked about a process. Uh, they're gonna have, um, you know, a, 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 a program on there that they use. Um, and they'll, as we, as we send them a request that we've approved by the oversight committee, that's then in our minutes, they'll they'll issue a check uh, based on having again a uh, uh, an application, a uh, a signed agreement, and uh, then receipts. And so, so we've got that documentation now. Receipts in case of income loss and things might not be an expense receipt. It might just be the application request. Okay. Ed, does the money then flow from the, like if you give a grant to a business, does the money flow from the county to the business or from the state to the business? No, we, we have we have a separate account we've set up for just this money. So you've already got the money. We, we got the money. We, we got it okay. a couple of weeks ago. We've set up a separate account. We've got a separate checking account and we'll actually just issue checks out of that. And that's where we'll keep all these records and the accounting firm will help us keep all that together and uh, uh, keep us out of trouble. <laughs> so in your case, the county is holding all the dollars, but it sounds like in like in, in Clay County, the county is dispersing that money to the cities and then the cities are then dispersing money. Right, right. Okay. I, I think there's pros and cons of that. 
uh, and it just it just depends on the situation. But again, uh, we've got such a good working relationship that I think all of us kind of want to be involved. And and we had a situation uh, yesterday where we had a request from a county entity, and uh, uh, I was uh, uh, tending to recommend it. Uh, but I got I got some uh, feedback from the city that actually on further thought I thought was actually was right, and they thought you know this doesn't quite meet the uh, the definition. Uh, however, there's another use that might meet the definition, and and uh, so you see how this group we have we can we can help each other, and that's actually what happened yesterday. That's perfect. Well, actually, Ed, you have a great segue. I think you're reading some of the questions coming in to me. Um, someone just shared that regional planning commissions um, have also been getting involved in the CARE Act's dollars. And this comment was that they have developed a lot of the document templates for applications and approval forms and agreements and tracking sheets. So utilize those regional planning commissions. They are, if, if your county doesn't have the capabilities um, or the, uh, the, the uh, uh, personnel, to manage something like this, um, those regional planning commissions can be a, a great resource um, and can help you with that. And, and you, you, as this person comments, you may not have to use an accounting firm. Um, your regional planning commission is there to help you and can be that resource for you. Um, I have one other quick question, one other quick question, and then uh, we've got to move on. And I know Ed has an appointment that he's got to get to. Um, when you mention receipts, does the business need to do the work first, or are they reimbursed? Um, or can they apply, receive the funds, and then submit receipts after completion? How are you guys uh, fashioning that? Well, we think we should have all the documentation before we disperse the money, which would be an application, uh, the signed agreement, and receipts. We we okay, think so we're going to reimburse all of that, and that, that, well, that protects us from not dispersing and then being short. Sure, you bet. Yeah, and that's how most grants work with the reimbursement type process. Well, Ed, Darren. Uh, Teresa, we want to thank you all very much for your, your knowledge and sharing with the group out there. I'm going to do a quick commercial for, let me get my mouse in the right spot, um, for next week. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we're going to have Randy Wilson, who's going to talk about uh, the Main Street design concept in this new COVID-19 uh, environment. Uh, Gayla, any last words? No, I just want to thank the great group in Chillicothe. Um, you guys do amazing work. Uh, I'm glad that other communities around Missouri can learn from you all this morning and see how everybody can just coming together, coming together at the table. It looks like you guys are just doing amazing things. As always, you guys make us proud as one of our great Main Street programs. Thank you very much. And I will throw out um, that uh, we did record this uh, webinar and we did reach our capacity. Um, and uh, so some folks were not able to uh, get into the webinar this morning. So that's a great problem to have, but unfortunately they weren't able to see it live. So there will be a recording and we'll share that um, um, later today and tomorrow. So thank you uh, guys very much. Have a great week. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Teresa. Have a great day. Thanks, thank everybody. You, thank you. How do I get out of here?